Limit is consumed by personal devotion. Yeah. I want to thank Selma and Jean and also Sarah who's not here for just giving me the opportunity to share before you guys tonight. So what I want to talk about with you a little bit is about Check. Do a little prayer, right? Check. Or we can even 
even treat prayer as more of a way to kind of fulfill what we want to be done for the day or maybe what we want to have in our life. <coughs> but what God wants from us is our whole heart. Right. Yes. Not just the piece of our heart, but the entire thing. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you ladies, how are you doing with being devoted to God in your personal relationship with God? And I'm in a relationship that we all get to see, like those moments when we're alone. Yeah. How are we doing in that personal right. relationship, right? So I'll be honest with you guys, our dear leader, my friend slash daughter slash leader, <laughs> has this uh, thing about having us have quiet times with people. And in my heart, I'm like, I don't want to have a quiet time with people. <laughs> Just to 
stay a Berean. Yeah, that's right. We all know this passage. It's one that we go with people often. It's about challenging people to be eager to examine the scriptures every day. But I want to give us a fourth E. I want us to add excited. Yeah. Right? To be excited, to enjoy our times with our God, to make them fun, to have dates with God. And I remember there was a time in my life where God and I would have coffee. And the donut together. And I had my little donut, and God had his donut. He was always such a generous gentleman. He would always let me eat his donut. <laughs> <laughs> and so God is. He's amazing, right? So we had a great time, and I got two donuts out of it. Um, and just to do special things with God, like make the time special, add some flavor to it. After a relationship goes on for some time, we need to do some things to spice it up, right? Yeah. And even go to special places with God. So I have special places with God in my house and outside my house. Oh, so I have a spot where I sit in my house. I have actually two spots where I sit in my house to have my time with God. But I also have spots where I go outside of the house. And one is just the parking lot around the corner. So it's not special to anyone else, but it's special yeah, to me. Right. I go there to be alone with God in my car able to pray, oh, yeah. sing, and whatever I want to do with God, yeah. you know, and um, just areas where you can go and, and spend time with your God. Yeah. The other thing we can do is learn other languages with God, because oh, the Bible was written in three different languages, right? There's Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and we can look up those words in the scriptures in those original languages to be able to get to know our God better. What was the word that he had with it, right? To look them up and to know the definitions of them. And there's an app I want to tell you guys about that I use, and it's free. It's called Accordance, A-C-C-O-R-D-A-N-C. And on that app, you can tap on a word, and it'll give you literally the, the original word. It'll give you the number of times it was in the Bible. It'll give you the definition of it. Then you can look up all the other places that is in the Bible. This is an amazing yes. app. And I love it because it really helps me to get a better connection and understanding to my God. But we're also to be eager, it says, which means we have to sometimes force ourselves to get up out of the bed like Jesus and get up early like Jesus before the sun is up and get time in with God. And it's a sacrifice, right? But if you do it, you're going to feel amazing. And it just changes the whole pace of your day. You've heard my husband share about how we got here. Prior to when we got here, we used to get up. He got up at 4.30 and bless his heart. And then woke me up at 5 so that we could have a quiet time together. And so I had this little mind trick I would play with myself. He'd come and wake me up. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, oh, no. This is what I'm going to say. I'm just saying, yay. I'm so excited to have time with God. <laughs> Yeah. So I love the song. 
song like Psalm 73 by Asaph. He talks about envy and how they can this and they can that. And then Psalm 109, David talks about how he's hurt by people, but he's kind of wanting God to kill them. You know, <laughs> same thing in Psalm 59. So you get a great example of there what it's like to just be raw and real with God. And at the end, you see him remember who God is, but also who God made him to yeah. so That's why I encourage you ladies to be consumed by your personal relationship to God.
motions, and they were calling other people to empty motions. Wow. Um, and so, again, Jesus saw potential in them, even when they, they totally blew it. And I'm grateful for this because I can really relate to it. Um, there was a, a time in my life, very soon after um, my second child, Elian, was born. Um, he's almost seven. But um, we lived in Denver at the time. And, and life was hard. Everything about life was hard. Um, I, I had postpartum depression. I was sick most of the time. Um, the church wasn't doing very well. My husband wasn't doing very well. Um, it snowed a lot, and my husband was just angry when it snowed. He's from the Pacific Islands, if you didn't know. And so life was just hard. But in, in this difficulty, I didn't run to God. I ran to food. I ran to TV. I ran to sadness. My discipling times with, with my friends would be mostly like commiserating and sadness. Wow. There, there wasn't Bible. There wasn't conviction. There wasn't love. And But I, I never missed church. Mm. I sang all of the songs. And I gave my money every week. Right. But I was the first person to leave. And I was not trying to like stay for leaders meetings wow. or, or do anything extra. I was just, I was going to do the bare minimum. I had the heart of a Pharisee wow. when I needed to have the heart of worship. Wow. Thankfully, God saw potential in me that not many other people could have. Um, and we have some really great examples. And man, God is awesome because my example of a heart of worship was Anna in Luke 2, verses 36 and 37. And Pam already gave us an excellent description of her, so I'm just going to build on that. Um, so she, um, just, just like Pam had said, she'd been a widow for 64 years, like around 64 years. And um, she was completely devoted day and night to fasting and praying. And so we can look at Luke 2, we can look at Anna as an incredible example, and then we can look at women in our congregation. Yeah. Like, you can, can look at women like Pam, and yeah. Shannon is going to share yeah. next, and Lindsay, who is up here, yeah. and Lisa Davis, as, as women who have been through the battle yeah. and still have a heart consumed by worship. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so then I look around the congregation, and I see women in every row who have a heart of worship. Yeah. But what God's asking is, he's asking us to go a little bit deeper. Yeah. So we're going to go over the three areas again. The three areas where we need to have a life of a Pharisee, but we're going to look at what the heart of worship looks like yeah. behind that obedience. Yeah. Um, and I want you to pick one. Pick one area that you're going to go deeper in, one of, one of these three areas. Okay. So let's talk about fellowship. Yes. Um, Ezekiel 33, 13. Jason read this on Sunday. If I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, none of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. Wow. This is talking about empty worship. And, and this can look like empty fellowship. Tell me if this looks familiar. Mm. Hey, sis, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Oh, wow. Hi, sis. <laughs> And then you have that conversation 16 times, and you're like, oh, thank goodness they're singing. I can go sit in my seat. Oh, <laughs> that's empty fellowship. Those are going through the motions, and then you're calling other people to go through empty motions. Fellowship is going to look like finding that sister who looks sad, who's sitting by herself, and going to sit with her. Yeah. Giving your heart in fellowship is often going to look like not spending the entire fellowship time with women in your Bible talk. Yeah. It's going to be finding people that you don't know as well. Yeah. And it's going to be giving the truth from your heart when you find that person. Yeah. What are you learning from God? Yeah. What are you going through? Yeah. Asking them the same questions and it, waiting, like silently, waiting for answers. Yeah, right. not, not just sharing all of your own heart, but letting them share yeah, as well. So yeah. that's the heart of fellowship, or the heart of worship when it comes to fellowship. Go on, um, Let's talk about singing. Okay. Yeah. The heart of worship look like in singing. Um, Ephesians 5.19. 
speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, I've got an example from Sunday morning. Um, Walter, Taryn, and Elizabeth, it was their last Sunday. Um, we're saying goodbye to them. Ole powerfully leads our song. <laughs> we get to the fourth verse, and he says, now sing to each other. And what does the vast majority of the congregation do? Ah. I love you with the love of the Lord. Okay, so when it says sing to each other, it should be, I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the right. Lord. We should be singing to each other. Yeah. That's what Ephesians 5 says to do. It says to sing to each other. Yeah. And, do, don't you want to go to that land? Right. So that's not, we're not, we're not asking God, because no. he's already there. Right. He's already there. Washington, D.C. My niece was there, too. So I'm indebted to Tramala. Great job tonight. And we do, I mean, we need these lessons, you guys. This is so important. And tonight, I've been asked to talk about consumed by the family. That's right. I'm very excited to talk about that. Um, I really just want to uh, share about building relationships and building family in the kingdom. Um, I come from a huge family. I'm Eastern European. I'm Croatian. Yeah. One of six. And um, my mom was one of nine. My dad was one of four. We used to come get together for these big gatherings. And I learned so much about family growing up. And I'm going to share a little bit about that. But you know, the Bible talks about how important the family is. And we know Matthew 6, 33, what does it say? It says, but first seek his kingdom 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So seeking first his kingdom, we use this when we study the Bible with people, and we know that the kingdom is the church, that the church is the family. It's the family of God. So it should be our number one priority, our number one priority. And these lovely ladies talked about just what a priority you know, the kingdom and the people of God should be because we truly are the people of God. Yeah. And we need to also have the conviction that we can't survive without the family of God, yeah. without yeah. relationships yeah. in the yeah. kingdom. Yeah. It keeps us saved. Yeah. I think the kingdom family too, we have to remember that it's the very body of Jesus. We represent Jesus's body. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the Bible says it's where God dwells. He puts his name here. Wow. He's here with us tonight. And we're so blessed. We should feel really honored and blessed and so excited and joyful. Um, it needs to start in our personal devotion, carry out through our worship, and, and be part of who we are. That's the family of God. And I love the scripture over in Acts too, if you guys can turn there. It's, a great, it's such a great example of how the family and relationships in the kingdom should be. To me, it's my gold standard for what re my relationships in the kingdom should be and how the kingdom of God should look. And so I'm gonna read starting in verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Yeah. Everyone, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And this was after 3,000 had gotten baptized. And you just see the continuity and the connection that they were all together and it's just amazing. This is the culture that we want to bring into the church because right now we're about 60 plus, seven, close to 70 people. This was 3,000 people that were connected like this in a family. And so we got to remember, we got to really have conviction. Everyone, all 3,000, it says they were devoted. Devoted, just a very simple childlike definition, is to be very loving and loyal. That's what that means. They had an adoration for each other. They looked at each other in the eye. They just they just respected one another. Wow. Everyone, all 3000, they were filled with awe. Yes, awe with God, but it was awe for each other. They respected and had an admiration and an excitement to see one another. Kind of like what Brianna talked about when her dad walked in the door and ran and hung on the We need to not like crazy, but hang on each other. That's so civilized. Like, you know what I mean? When I see Selma, I want to look in the eye. I'm just, I couldn't wait to give her a hug. She's got, I got to go to the bathroom. Oh, my God. That's 
I'm sure it was like a holiday feast every time they got together. Like, a, you know, our Bible talk should be like this. It just should be weird. But I was so weird. You know, we used to, when I first got here, we used to go out and go get a coffee and tea. We didn't care that we had to work the next day. Or, you know, we just went out. We went out. We wanted to be together. And that's the way it was. And then you could just go on and on and, and really just see this, but use this scripture as a gold standard. And I just have to ask family, do you feel like this describes your relationship in the church? You know, are you in awe of each other? Do you have a mutual respect, a mutual adoration? We can adore each other. We just admire one another. We have opportunity here, okay? Because here's the thing, we've had a lot of move-ins, which is awesome. And we've also had a lot of baptisms, which is awesome. You know what? It's a guarantee to keep us safe. We've got to get to know each other on a deeper level. And so I want us to have this mindset, okay, that we all, Every single one of us, we need each other. Every single person, we need each other. And it's good to have structure in the kingdom. We've got campus. We've got singles. We've got marriage. That is the structure. But that can't be our mindset. Okay? That can't be our mindset. We need to see that we need each other. The older disciples need the younger disciples. The younger disciples need the older disciples. We should be sitting with each other that way and fellowshipping with each other. You guys, people like, I think it was trauma said, we've got years of experience as older people. I was 19 when I got baptized. Now I'm 60. because she taught me how to value older people, how to speak up to older people. Yeah. I loved her. She taught me. I adored her, and she adored me. And it was, she taught me things that I could never learn just by reading. Yeah. She taught me yeah. how to look people in the eye when I talk. Wow. And they didn't teach me that in school. No. They did not teach me these things. They don't teach you family in school. And many of us come from broken family. And so I want to use this, if you'll let me to use this. And we need to help each other and teach. And if you're younger, I want to just be an example for you. Not to, to tell you how to do it, but just to show you. To show you how to do it. And I think also when I got baptized in the campus, we were all together. We were just campus little. We were always going around because we didn't have the technology that, technology that we had today. We didn't have phones. So what we had, we built really deep relationships by face to face. Can you believe that? We didn't have phones. We couldn't text people. We couldn't text. So we, would, we saw each other every day. Every day we needed it. And here's the thing, we really appreciated the merits in the church because you know what they did? They gave us time, they brought us over to their house, and we just had this connection. They didn't do much other than just give us time. Yeah. And they fed us. And we were like, wow, you guys are awesome. <laughs> but I think that's what we've got to do that in between Wednesday and Sunday. And I've got some practicals for you, and um, I just want you guys to, well, first of all, I want to back up. I want to tell you one other way that we need to connect as a family, okay. and that's through just different family activities. We have Mercy Worldwide, and I really want to applaud the people that came, but we have an opportunity. We had 330 that came out. 
And if you came out, thank you. But if you didn't, it's an opportunity. It's a family activity. Yeah. And we need yeah. to be there for our family. Amen. We have barbecues. We have, I know someone announced we're going to have a singles Devo. We need to be there, you guys. Yeah. This is our family. Right. And it's got to be the heart. And just quickly, just some practicals in building relationships. Okay. I think you got to just set up those quiet times and prayer times. You can pray over the phone, but just get connected during the week. Yeah. You know, the younger disciples, just invite yourself over to the older disciples' homes. Just do it. Just say, hey, I want to come to your house. <laughs> and then set up game nights and movie nights with the older and younger. Don't just do campus. Yeah. You know, we have movies. Okay. and just be you know just admire what you have here because not no one has what we have and we need to really appreciate it and I just have a quick motto that I use in relationship building it's I accept the Bible says to accept one another yeah. I encourage I always look for opportunities the Bible says to encourage one another daily yeah. it's, a, it's not a Suggestion. Right. We're supposed to encourage one another daily. And that's what I do in my relationship building. And then I pray. I pray for my relationships. I pray before I come to church who I'm going to fellowship with. Yeah. I write down just two names is plenty. I'm like, okay, I need to see this sister and I need to see that sister. And then since we have so many new people, I make myself meet at least one new disciple. Because I want to know my family and I don't. I don't want to just know their name. I want to know who they are. I want to know their heart. I want to know their upbringing. And for me, I've got to get their number and spend time with them afterwards. And that's what it's all about. So just think about this family. Make sure you seek first the kingdom. Make sure that Acts 2.42 is your gold standard. If you forget what to do, how to build relationship, read Acts 2.42. It starts with the heart. The motto for me is um, accept, encourage, and pray for your fellowship. Pray for your friends. Thank you guys so much.